What's up? What's up? You guys all right out there? Sleeping? I I have a knack to put babies to sleep. Um, I didn't know I did adults too. Actually, I know. I do adults all the time, every week. Uh, So hopefully you guys aren't asleep already. I still have my sermon to go. Good to see you. Everybody feeling okay? You guys all right? Yeah, slow clap. Yeah, clap for yourselves. That's okay. All right, wake up. Well, slow clap. Um, Good stuff, man. Good morning. Good to see you guys. Thank you so much for being here, as I mentioned already. And uh, thanks to the families, the extended families of those uh, children that were dedicated. I know you're here to support your family and uh, and support those that were on stage. And so thank you guys so much for joining us and being here with us today. Uh, I'm going to jump into a message. Uh, This is part three of a series, but we'll give you enough background if you haven't been with us the first two. Um, And uh, really actually excited about this one more than the others because it's something that I personally deal with a lot. And uh, we're going to be talking a lot about doubt. And uh, if you've ever had doubt, especially in a setting like this, um, you hear a guy up here uh, talking about stories that are seemed a little bit unbelievable, um, kind of far-fetched or maybe even impossible, and uh, you struggle with how it fits scientifically or if it's really even possible, uh, is, this, is this thing really true? If you've ever battled with doubt, uh, I'm pumped that you're here because today's message is going to be just for you. It's going to be perfect, and, uh, and so I'm so glad you're here with us today. As I mentioned, we are in a series called Greater. Uh, not all decisions are created equal. Just because we've decided one way or the other doesn't mean that either decision is okay. That's why we have things like list of pros and cons. Uh, that's why we have, uh, you know, choices to figure out which is the best decision, which is the, the other decision. Can I get a different mic? This thing's hiccuping on me. Better? Is that better? Here we go. There we go. A little more volume too, man. I'm going to blow you guys out this morning. I'm just keep switching mics until I get to find the loudest one. Not all decisions are created equal. Um, and, and here's the principle that we've been learning as we go through this process is that your decisions determine your direction, and it's your direction that determines your destination. Uh, we can't just make a, a, a kind of a, a, a jerk move and, and yank the wheel and end up in the place we want to end up. There's a thousand different decisions that need to happen so we can get to the place where we need to go. And so this is the principle behind this series is that there are decisions that are greater than the others. Week one, we learned that brokenness is greater than safety. Not always uh, is the safe decision the best decision. If you missed that uh, message, there's a, it's up on the, uh, the website. You can check it out. Oh. And catch up. All these mics are going to, I'm just going to scream, you know, with a bullhorn, you know, or something. Um, And then last week we looked at uh, obedience being better than options. A lot of times we don't believe these two things are opposite, but they are. Uh, There was one thing that I've still been, uh, just been blowing my mind is the fact that uh, options, uh, disobedience is actually distractions. Uh, To be disobedient is to be distracted. And so uh, the options turn out to be a distraction for us and uh, and it keeps us from being obedient. And that's up on the site too. You should catch up. Well, today we're going to be talking about faith, as we mentioned. And I actually struggled with what uh, faith is greater than, and I think that is really the, the part of the message that is, uh, is the, the best for me, is that there really is no opposite to this, and I'm going to leave it open, and I'm just going to say this, faith is greater. Faith is greater. I, I wanted to say faith is greater than doubt, uh, but that's not true. Faith is greater than reason and logic, and, and that's not true either. Um, I want to unwrap this together and unpack this idea that faith is the greater option. Even though we may have doubts, even though our reason and our logic may not back up completely what we are are trying to to, to, uh, believe and we're still wrestling with what our reason, uh, how our reason works, faith is always the greater option. And so we ask ourselves questions like, you know, am I going to trust God when it doesn't seem like he's he's coming through? And when the world is closing in around me, am I I still going to believe God's promise for me? Am I going to trust his leading even though it looks like it's, it's leading me down a dangerous path. It, like, do I trust all these things? Do I, am I still going to believe when it doesn't look like it's actually the right decision? Well, I, I want to show you today that faith is actually the greater 
option. If you got a Bible, grab it and turn with me to Genesis chapter 15. We've been looking at the life of Abraham. He has been our principal character through this story. Genesis chapter 15 is where we're going to be. Uh, there's some Bibles around you. If you didn't bring one, we also have it on the screen as you, you go along. Uh, and in your handout, there's a little place to take some notes. I encourage you to grab that in a pen and, and follow along with us. Uh, Abraham, we understood. We have to get our minds around him. We have to understand his father, uh, this guy named Sarah. And that was week one. Well, week two, Abraham picked up where Terah left off. Well, now we're getting into the, the, to the meat of Abraham's life, the promises uh, that God starts to give him. And so the covenant that God engages with him is the first ever in Scripture uh, like this. And, and I want to show it to you. Genesis chapter 15, starting at the first verse. Here we go. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham says back to God, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, you've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Essentially saying, God, you can bless me all you want, but when I die, it's just going to be spread out to everyone else. It's not going to carry on through my, 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 my generations. I have no children. You haven't given me an heir, verse 4. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. Verse 5. He took him outside and said, look up at the, at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. I love how God has a very sarcastic tone, you know? Hey, well, go ahead and count them, if you can, <laughs> you know? Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be, verse 6, and this is our key verse for the day. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. This is a humongous Verse, verse 6, if you're, you have your Bible there, underline it, or maybe you're on your Bible app, highlight it, bookmark it. This is a key verse. Abraham believed. That's the first time we actually see the word believe in Scripture. And they've gone through all the generations from Adam to Seth to down on through the children and to Noah and the generations that passed and Terah, and then we get to Abraham. It's the first time we see this word believe in Scripture. And anytime you see a first like that, it sets a precedent for all the rest of Scripture. And it's important for us to get into our minds. Abraham believed the Lord, and God credits, credits it to him as righteousness. He credits to him as righteousness. He puts it in his account as righteousness. Can we pray real quick as we jump into our, our, our text and, and kind of unpack this and allow God to speak to us? Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for preserving these words, all these generations, so that we today can open them up, read them, and be challenged by them. And so I pray that you open our hearts and our minds this morning. I pray that, that, that you would speak to us and we would hear your voice and not be distracted uh, by the other voices, not be distracted by doubt or fear or anything else in between. But God, I pray freedom today, freedom in our hearts that, we, that any of us that wrestle with doubt, we would not feel disqualified from believing, but we would find ourselves in the same company as some of the greats of scripture. And so we thank you for what you're doing and what you will do today. We pray all these things in your name. And everybody said, amen. amen. So, Faith. Faith is, a, is, a odd, is an odd thing. Faith is, a, is kind of a mysterious word. It's very synonymous with, uh, with belief. Um, you, you know, it's, we say things like, hey, if you just had more faith, or, um, you know, if you just believed, or uh, if anybody knows the story in Scripture, Jesus says, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. And anybody ever read that and said, what does that mean? Anybody ever thought that? Because I've stared at many a mountain and actually quoted that verse. This is what church kids do. We actually try to, you know, live scripture. And I stood at a, you know, I said, all right, God, I'm believing. <laughs> and I got nothing. I just want to tell you, it's, it's, it's done nothing for me so far. I, I have no, no evidence. I mean, what does that mean? What is faith? What is belief? Like, what? It's, it's a very odd, mysterious word uh, for us to, to use in everyday language. And if, you, if you're in a church service at any point in your life, you'll probably hear the word belief or faith or believe a thousand times in, the, in an hour or so that you're gathered with a group of people because it's the cornerstone of all that happens in our relationship with God. It's, it's the foundation of our interactions with him. And so faith is this funny word. It's very ethereal and hard to put our hands around. 
uh, but it's very crucial to what we do. And so first thing I want to do this morning is debunk a couple myths about faith. Uh, I'll do a, cu- a little bit, some teaching and, and debunk some myths about faith, and then I'm going to preach at you a little bit, which just means I get louder and I spit further. That's all that preaching means. Uh, and so first thing first, let, I want to debunk a couple myths. And the first thing I want us to know is that faith and belief, they are not the absence of doubt. See, most of us believe that if I have doubt, I'm disqualified from faith. That if I, if I have any type, any semblance of I don't know, uh, that, that we have this, we, we are disqualified from faith. Well, doubt is not the opposite of faith. It's actually unbelief, which is the opposite of faith. Doubt is a part of the process in the middle. And I, I want to show, show this to you in a, uh, in a, in a pretty interesting, interesting way. First thing, we're going to do this. I have $10 in my pocket. It's right here. It's a nice crisp bill. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's 10 bucks. You could spend it anywhere. The first person that can run up on stage and stand on this green carpet, I'm going to give them 10 bucks. Go. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> He said run up. He, he was technically, he was, oh, Rob should get a consolation prize. There you go. It's 10 bucks. Yeah, man. I messed, I messed it up. I messed it up. I messed it up. You got to run off stage too. You got to give that back to me. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So, all right, now check this out. First said, hey, I got 10 bucks in my pocket. Everybody in the room first, and it's very unconsciously, you know, subconscious, you may, may think, I don't know. I can't see it. Does, does he really have $10 in his pocket? I said, anyone who runs up on stage is going to get free 10 bucks. The first thing, you actually doubted it. You, you may not have been conscious or aware of it, but you doubted, I can't see the 10. Is he lying to me? Is he playing some kind of cruel trick? The first thing we did is we, we doubted it. Then you started to reason. Well, PC seems like a pretty decent guy. He did lie to me that one time, or he didn't return my text. You know, he... He'd, I got some Facebook message buried in his, his feed. It's, you know, from two years ago. He never responded to. He's, he's an okay guy, but sometimes he's not 100%. But he's a preacher, and, and these guys are not allowed to lie, especially in front of other people. So maybe I'll believe him. Maybe I'll go. And there was one, two people. I saw another person over here jump. Three people made a choice to believe what I said. But all of us in the room wrestled with doubt. And it may have happened in a fraction of a second. Each of us wrestled with this thing called doubt. See, doubt is to have, it comes from a Greek Greek word that uh, that means to have two minds about one thing. A Greek word that means to have two minds about one thing. So doubt stands in the middle of belief and faith and unbelief. It stands in the center and it says, he may have $10 or he may not have $10. I don't know. I can't see it. I I have to like step out on faith. See, the people who didn't move, it was just as as much faith as the people who ran up on stage. It was like, I don't see it. I'm going to choose to not believe it. That's what unbelief is. All of us wrestled with doubt, which is in the center of faith in unbelief. It's to have two minds about one thing. There may or may not be $10 in his pocket. We all wrestled with doubt. We just may have not have been conscious about this process. This is, this is why unbelief is the opposite of faith, because unbelief is to have one mind about one thing. You ever talk to someone that says, I choose to not believe that that's going to work out. Maybe with a politician, I don't believe they're going to be, you know, follow through with their promises. Or maybe a business owner uh, says, hey, we're going to do this. You know, this is our plans. We're going to go and, 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 and it's going to be like that. And you say, well, I choose not to believe it. For one reason or another, I choose to not, not, I doubt it. A doubt is to be on the fence. Unbelief is to say, absolutely not. I choose that this is, I choose not to believe this is actually going to happen. Unbelief is on one side. Faith is on the other. Doubt is the entry to the bridge that connects unbelief and faith. Doubt is the place we enter the bridge between these two. 
I said, I have $10 in my pocket. I just created an opportunity for you to believe me or to not believe me. Doubt is actually the entry point for us in this equation. I forced you into it. Believe me or not believe me, I had $10 in my pocket. I was telling the truth because I'm a, I'm a righteous guy. You know, I'm a Christian. I don't lie. But the doubt was, <laughs> that was too much laugh, Kat. God, too much laugh. Doubt is the entry point for the process between believing and not believing. That's why it's so important. If you've ever wrestled with doubt, it doesn't disqualify you from faith. It actually qualifies you for it. Because if you just blindly said, yeah, okay, that's not belief. That's just being an automaton, right? Or you're just following along like a robot. A human has the ability to process and to reason. And so when something is, is laid out in front of us, doubt is the entry point for us to believe or to not believe. Everybody tracking with me so far? So faith is not the absence of doubt. It's also not the absence of reason. This is not the absence of reason. For many of us believe that faith, to, to have actual faith, we need to turn our brains off. And we can't actually have logic and we can't actually think through things. A lot of us uh, have been taught that, that faith is, is the absence of science, right? These are enemies. That's garbage because science actually informs my faith. Science actually tells me how God did it. When scientists find this way that these, you know, protons have been split into a thousand different things and there's this string theory and this is how things happen and this is the, you know, the, the elements of creation, I say, oh, that's cool. That's how God did it. It doesn't tell me that God's not real. Anybody tracking with me, right? It's not the, obs the absence of reason. Reason is a part of my journey uh, in the process. Now, we do this all the time. It might not be with $10 in our pocket or what have you, but anytime we walk into a room and there's a chair in front of us, we go through this process of whether we're gonna sit in it or not. Most of us have, all the chairs in our lives that we've sat in have supported us. None of them have fallen apart. None of them have, uh, have, have disappeared or been some kind of cruel joke unless you were in high school and somebody pulled out the chairs, you sat down, anybody ever had that, you know? I pray that God punished that kid. <laughs> severely for the time he did that to me. I mean, it set my middle school career just off on a trajectory, you know what I mean? I was the kid who fell for like three years. It was bad. Anyway, we look at the chair and we go and say we're at a work party and people are hanging out and there's an open chair. We go over to it. Unconsciously, we go through the process. Will I sit or will I not sit? Some of us look at the chair and we say, I don't know. It, it doesn't look like it's going to hold my weight. It looks too, like an Ikea thing, and it's probably going to fall apart. It's been put together two or three times. Like, you know, you only get one shot with an Ikea piece of furniture. Like, it doesn't move. You just leave it in one spot. I don't know if I want to sit on this. I actually don't want to look dumb. If it falls apart, I would rather stand. So we go through the same process. Every single time you and I make a decision, we go through the same process. I'm not sure. Then we go through the process of reason. Well, this looks to be kind of sturdy. I may not be able to touch it, but it looks pretty good. We go through the process of reason. Then we make a choice to believe or to not believe. So faith is not the absence of doubt. It's also not the absence of reason. There is a, a process between these two. Doubt is the entry point that we take. The next step is reason. After reason is a choice. After a choice is the experience. After the experience is this thing called certainty. This is the process of believing or not believing. They are all the same. We go through the same process every single time. We step in and say, I don't know, I can't see the $10. I don't know, I can't touch the chair. I don't know if it's real or if it's not. And then we start to reason. Chris is a pretty cool dude. I believe he would give me $10. I, I think he's, a, hopefully that's what you thought. You know, he's a pretty good guy. He'll give me 10 bucks. Or we look at the chair and we say, it looks pretty sturdy. I'll go for it. That's the process of reasoning and of logic, right? Then we make a choice. I will sit down. I will run up on the stage. We make a choice. And then comes the experience, in the process of faith, my man came up on stage and he's standing up here in front of a crowd of people and he's saying, hey, I ran up here. You, you better have $10 in your pocket, you know? That's the, the emotions he's having at this, 
you better give me my 10 bucks. I just ran up here. I pulled 10 bucks out of my pocket. He's like, all right, I got paid to come to church. So this is what, you know, I got, I got paid. This is great. You know, lunch on me. I'm going to mission. That's probably worth a meal. Or you sit on the chair and you have the experience of, okay, it held my weight. All right, I'm good, you know? Once you have the experience, it leads to certainty. So you ever talk to someone that says, oh, I'm, I'm positive. Jesus went to the cross. He died. He rose three days later. I'm positive of it. How are you positive of it? You weren't there. I wasn't there, right? We can't just blindly accept and say, I'm absolutely certain without going through this process to belief or to unbelief. See, doubt is, is the entry point, but reason is the, the next place. Check this out. There are 300 or plus Old Testament prophecies about a Messiah that was going to come and, 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 and save the world. 300 plus uh, prophecies about this. The, uh, say, let's just take eight major ones. The probability that Jesus, Jesus fulfilled all of them. The probability that any person would fulfill only eight of the prophecies is one. Let me show you this. This is crazy. One to the tenth, one in ten to the seventeenth power. Let me show you what that looks like. This is one, two, three. This is one in one quintillion. That's 18 zeros. That's a lot. It's like a million millions, I think, something like that. Anybody that can count, just correct me later. But this is a lot, right? The probability that one person would fulfill only eight of the Old Testament prophecies, only eight of them, is one in one quintillion. That's the probability. And Jesus fulfilled all 300 plus of them. Let me put it in, in, in another term. This is a 50 cent piece, right? I'm not giving this one away. So I know some of you were like this. No, not happening. If I had one quintillion 50 cent pieces, I could fill up the state of Texas up to two feet high, 24 inches high, the state of Texas. I could fill it up. Now, let's say I took one of these and I, and I made marks on it. You know, I, I kind of drew X's or something like that. And as a plane was flying over, I threw out the 50-cent piece that had marks on it somewhere over the state of Texas that was filled two feet high with 50 cent, one quintillion 50-cent pieces. The probability that I could send a guy blindfolded into the state of Texas and he reached down and pick up the one that had marks on it is one in one quintillion. Right? Some of you guys are like, you lost me at 50 cent piece. I don't know what else. That's the probability that Jesus would fulfill only eight of the prophecies. He fulfilled 300 in some. And so when I apply my reason, my logic to, to the scripture, it starts to bear itself back to me. It starts to tell me, yeah, this is legit. Yeah, this is real. This can be verifiable. This is actually approvable. See, my faith is not just some acceptance of some, you know, some things that people gave to me. Hey, believe this. this. This is what you need to believe. Okay, sounds good. To get to heaven, I just got to say yes. No, I first doubted it, just like we all did. And then I applied my reason to the process, just like we all did. And the, dig, the deeper we dig, we'll find that our logic and our reason actually informs our faith. It doesn't disprove and it doesn't disqualify my faith. And so for the thinkers in the room, some of you guys that can't just accept a, a statement for what it is, you have to think about it and test it and find out if it's true or if it's not true. Keep testing because God is faithful. Keep applying your reason and keep testing it and trying to prove it because it will come to pass that you will believe. It's not the absence of doubt. It's not the absence of reason. Faith is the, ab the, the opposite of unbelief, which is to choose 100% unequivocally that I will not believe. I want to show you a couple of verses about faith and about why this is so important 
to us as we get ready to wrap up this morning. So you say to yourself, okay, so what? what why is this, imp- why do I care? Why, why, why should I pay attention to all this stuff? Because faith is actually the foundation of our interaction between us and God. The process of doubt and, and reason and choice and the experience and to be certain about our faith and our belief, one way or the other, because it's the same process, but in our faith, it's the foundation of our interaction between us and God. The Apostle Paul is one of the greatest theologians of Christianity will ever know, probably the greatest theologian Christianity will ever know. He actually chose this verse, 15.6 of the, the book of Genesis, as the centerpiece of his dissertation of the book of Romans, which is this mind-blowing letter that he wrote to a, a, the church in Rome. It's a, it's a library of theology. He chose this one verse, Genesis 15.6, the one we just read that said, Abraham believed and God credited to him as righteousness. I want to read for you a couple verses that we find in the New Testament where Paul puts faith as the cornerstone of what we believe. Here's the first one, Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17. Paul says, look, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. What's the gospel? It's the good news that God came to earth, took on the sins of mankind, went to the cross, conquered death, hell, and the grave, and rose back from the the grave three days later. That's the, the gospel story. It's the good news. He says, I'm not ashamed of it. It sounds ridiculous. For Paul to say he was not ashamed, there had to be a process where Paul said, should I be ashamed of this? Because this sounds ridiculous, right? Doesn't it sound ridiculous? I mean, honestly, it sounds ridiculous, right? Paul says, no, I'm not going to be ashamed of it. You know why? Because I reason that there's something deeper going on, and I want to choose to believe. And as I do, I begin to experience the power of God. Listen to this, Romans 1. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who does what? Believes. Believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Abraham was the first, and then it went out from there. Verse 17. For in the gospel, the story that God came to mankind, took the sins of mankind on his shoulders, went to the cross, conquered death, hell, and the grave, and rose from the third day. For in that story, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. If you have a King James or a New King James, it says from faith to faith. It's proved from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Let me read you another verse, Romans chapter 10. He he says the same thing. He says, look, for if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you what? Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and you are saved. Let me show you in the gospel, the, the book of John, the gospel of John. He writes this about Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 12, he says, Yet to all who did receive him, and he qualifies what receive him is, to those who believed in his name, He gave the right to become children of God. You mean I can be a child of God just by making a choice to believe? Yes, that's exactly what Paul is saying. Now, that sounds too good to be true, that all I have to do is just say, okay, I I believe, and that's it? Yup, that's it. Salvation happens at that very moment. You mean do I have to recite a certain prayer? Do I got to repeat after you, PC? No, you don't have to do any of that stuff. Those are just tools to get us to the place to believe at a heart level. You say, well, that sounds too good to be true. Yeah, it is. It is too good to be true. It does feel like that there's got to be something more, but that's the human condition that I need to earn it. I need to deserve it. But Paul said, look, no, no, no. I'm not ashamed of that story because it's showing me the power of God for all who believe. Leave. Faith is the greater option, always. Which John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would, what, believe in him has eternal life. They're not gonna perish. Jesus himself says this word that belief is the cornerstone of this, this process, this interaction between us and God. Believing is the beginning of living. Believing is the beginning of of living. See, many of us are at the party of life. We see the chair. I don't know if I want to sit. I, I, I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I want to risk it. I'm not sure if I want to risk it because I might look, I might look foolish if I do. And so we think that we're just going to stand here. And we've been standing for two hours at the party and we're thinking, man, my legs are killing me. I either got to leave or I got to sit. I got to leave or I got to sit. I don't know what I'm going to do. 
We're standing, we're thinking we're having a good time, we're thinking we're really living, avoiding the process, but it's not avoiding the process, it's not really living, we're living in this place of doubt, refusing to make up our mind one way or the other. We're missing out on the party because we're preoccupied with whether we should sit or we shouldn't. Scripture says, get off the fence, wrestle with your doubt, and honest wrestling with your doubt, do it. But you're not, you're not going to experience what life really is all about until you begin to believe. Believing is the beginning of living. And everything up until that point is a process to get us there. I'm going to show you Abraham's wife because she didn't believe as quickly as he believed. Not everyone around you is going to believe what you believe. It's just a fact of life. You may have gone through this process and you say, okay, Jesus, yeah, cross, third day, Easter, I'm down. I believe. Maybe you were that type of person that you just went for it and everything is cool. Not everybody goes through the same process. Let me show you Moses, I mean Abraham's wife real quick in uh, Genesis chapter 18. I'm going to read it for you real fast and I'll have it for you on the screen. Genesis 18, here's the context. This is an Old Testament sighting of Jesus. J Abraham is out there talking to Jesus. There's three people, three visitors. Some theologians believe it's the Trinity. Some theologians believe that it's Jesus and two angels. Anyway, these guys are not human. These are not normal, just everyday passengers, and Abraham realizes it. So he's out there talking to him. Verse 9, chapter 18, one of them says, hey, where's your wife Sarah, they asked him. Abe says, he's in, she's there in the tent. And then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, context, she's in her 90s at this point. She's in her 90s. She's well past childbearing days. He says, I'm going to come back this time next year. I'm going to, I'm going to add one more year to it just to show you that I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. And she's going to have a son. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. Verse 12, so Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm worn out, if my Lord is old, now I'm going to have this pleasure. She laughs. She's like, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, right. You're not the only one, right? It sounds ridiculous. Sarah says, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. Verse 13, then the Lord said to Abraham, why'd Sarah laugh and say, well, I really have this child now that I'm old? God hears your laugh. I love that. Verse 14, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Woo! He's like, you think I can't do it? Are you, is this a dare? <laughs> I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Verse 15, now check this out. This is, this is hilarious. You got you to gotta read scripture with a sense of humor. Sarah was afraid, and so she lied. She said, I didn't laugh. <laughs> and God says, oh, yeah, you did laugh. <laughs> no, it didn't. Yeah, you did. No, it didn't. Yeah, you did. This is hilarious. God's got a sense of humor. Why'd you laugh? I didn't laugh. Yeah, you did. I heard it. Mom! <laughs> Believing is the beginning of living. Sarah's standing there saying, God can't use me. There's no way. I'm not even going to put myself through this process because I'm, I'm 92 years old. I, don't, I have no business going to Target in the maternity section shopping for myself. People are going to look at me like I'm ridiculous. Uh, you know, I, you know, I hit that four or five month place and you start to show. And people are going to be like, how old? by the way, you know, this is foolish. I'm not even going to go through this process. God, you're going to make me look like an idiot if I believe this is true. And by the way, it's impossible. You can't do it. God can't use me. There's no way. I'll look like a fool if he does. And by the way, God, it's impossible. If you've ever felt that way, welcome to the club. God told Noah, hey, I want you to build an ark because it's going to rain. It had never rained before. God tells Moses, hey, I want you to free your people. He's like, I'm a murderer. I actually killed a guy. I buried him in sand because I don't want anybody to know about it, but they found out about it. You, can't you call someone else? He's a leader with a stutter. He's standing in front of God saying, look, I can't even talk, bro. Why are you going to pick me to do this? David was a teenage shepherd. He was out in the fields, and now he stands before a Goliath, before a giant, and, and he's standing there with a choice. Do I do something or do I not do something? Esther, in the Old Testament, she won a beauty pageant. That's it. That was her only qualification. She was a looker. She was hot. 
That was it. How about Mary in the New Testament? The angel comes down and says, you're blessed and highly favored. Oh, time out, time out. No, no, no. To birth God? I ain't that favored. No. You, and by the way, it's impossible because I'm a virgin. Unless you failed biology, God, and I don't think you did, this is not going to work. Jesus was just the son of a carpenter. What business did he have claiming that he was God? God can't use us. This is the thing that we say to ourselves. There's no way he can use me at this point. Do you know what I have done? And plus, I will look foolish if I try to go through the process. Noah's out there building an ark. People come up and say, hey, Noah, what are you building? An ark. What's an ark? I don't know. <laughs> it just told me it was going to rain. What's rain? I have no idea. He's building I don't know for I don't have an idea. It's like who's on first and what's on second, right? Can you imagine the round and round? Moses is standing there with the army coming behind him, and he's got a sea in front of him, and a million people, a million people is a lot of people, gathered around him, pressed against the sea. There's death behind them, and there's a sea in front of him, and all he's got in his hand is a stick. That looks ridiculous. David is standing before a giant. He's got a spear and a shield, and he's got a sling, a sling. That can't do anything. Was he going to, you know, bleed on him? Like, you know, with... Just slap him with it. I, you know, like, what? It looks stupid. Esther walks before the king, and she's not even summoned to the king. She looks like a fool because the last queen who did it lost her head. She's standing in front of him on a hope and a prayer. Mary goes to Joseph and says, I know you're not going to believe this because I know you know what we haven't done but I'm pregnant and it's God's. Yeah. <laughs> Heard that one. God, you can't use me. You don't know where I come from. And plus, I'm going to look like a fool if I go through this process. And by the way, God, it's impossible. Noah's got the ark done and he's standing on there. Okay, now what? I've looked like an idiot for a hundred years. People have been laughing at me passing and then one drop of rain comes down. Now who looks like the fool, right? God looks down to heaven and says, don't tell me what's impossible. Impossible is what I do. Moses is standing out there on the boat, I mean on the sea and he's got the army coming behind him and he's saying, all right, God, now what do we do? Now what do we do? It's impossible. I can't do it. And God says, just put your stick out over the water. Just extend it. People are going to know that you're not gifted. It's not you, it's me. <laughs> Waters recede. God's like, don't tell me what I can't do. Impossible is what I'm good at. David stands before a giant and he says, man, I don't know. You got a whole lot more stuff. I'm just going to put my rock in here and I'm going to sling it like I always do. I imagine his eyes were closed. <laughs> Bam! God says, man, don't tell me what I can and can and can't do. Impossible is my business. Esther goes before the king and says, I know this is impossible. I'm not even supposed to come to you before I'm summoned. And God says, no, 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 you don't tell me what I can and can't do. Impossible is my business. And Esther stopped a whole Jewish genocide because she was honest and said yes to Jesus. Said yes to what God was telling her to do. Mary steps up and says, okay, angel, I'm going to do it. Goes to Joseph, I, I, I'll, carry, I'll carry God. I'll carry him in my womb. God wants to birth something amazing through you. And he needs you to say yes. And you're saying, it's impossible, God. You can't do it. A, you can't use me because you don't know where I've been. B, I'll look like a fool if I even try. And three, it's impossible. And God says, don't you tell me what I can and cannot do. Impossible is what I'm good at. And so here's my challenge as we close out today. Get ready. The band can get ready to come forward. Believe. Go through the process. Believe. Say yes. You say, well, well, PC, I got doubts. Welcome to the club. All of us have had doubts. Every single one in these scriptures have had doubts. They've all said, this is not going to work. You know that, right? You can't use me to do it. Uh, B, I'm going to look like a fool. And C, it, it, it's impossible. My challenge to you is this. Know that God can use you, and he wants to. And he's waiting for you to say yes. And he's not going to make you look like a fool. 
you, and this pro, is, is it going to fall? Is, am I going to stand on stage and not have $10? Am, am I going to look like an idiot? God always comes through on his promises. Always. That scripture at the end, uh, we don't have time to get into it, 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 but the righteous will live by faith. The first time it's actually mentioned in the book of Habakkuk, it says the righteous will live by his faithfulness. The righteous live by God's faithfulness, not by our faith. My faith has no power to do anything for me. I live by the faithfulness of God. He's done it before, he'll do it again, and so I say yes. Every time I go through the process from doubt to reason and reason to choice and choice to experience and, and that experience leads me to a certainty. Every time I do it, it makes the next time I say yes all that much easier because God is always faithful. He'll never, ever let you down. So you say, well, PC, I, I, I don't know. I got doubts and I may look like an idiot giving it a try. And by the way, it's impossible, man. I mean, I, I'm a single mom. There's no, there's no reason why I should be able to raise my family. Impossible is what God does. You say, well, I'm an addict, Pastor Chris. You don't know. I never, I never get away from this. This is with me for the rest of my life. There's no, I have no business being free of that addiction. Well, let me tell you something. Impossible is what God does. You may look at yourself in the mirror and say, man, I, I've been through so much. I've done so many bad things to, to other people. It's impossible for God to do anything through me. Impossible is what God is good at. And he's waiting for you to say yes. Not blindly, not without doubt, not without reason. Doubt leads to my faith. Reason informs it. He's waiting for you to say yes this morning. Will you believe he is who he said he is? And that he'll do what he said he'll do? If you do, your life will never be the same. Let me ask you to join me in a posture of prayer this morning. Heads bowed, eyes closed across the place. We're going to close together in prayer this morning. But before we do, I'm actually going to give us an opportunity to, to believe. The presence of your doubt doesn't disqualify you. The presence of your your reason wrestling back and forth between yes or no doesn't disqualify you. It actually qualifies you to be the one to say yes. So this morning, if you stand here in this room and you say, Pastor Chris, I, I, I never had a relationship with God. I've never actually believed in him. I've been wrestling with all this stuff and I thought that it, it disqualified me from being part of the, the crew, being, being one who believes. Let me tell you today, he's waiting for you to say yes. In a moment, we're all gonna pray, pray together across the room, front to back, side to side. We're all gonna pray. But before we do, if you wanna begin a relationship with it today, if you wanna declare your belief in him today, even as small as it may be, to count to three, I want you just to lift your hand high. Say, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna begin. I don't have to have it all figured out. I'm just gonna step out and say yes this morning. If that's you, one, know that he loves you more than you will ever know. Two, you are not disqualified because impossible is what he does. Three, just lift your hand in the air. Say, that's me. Hands across the room. Wow. One, two, three, four, five. Awesome. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Man, wow. Eleven, twelve, thirteen. On the third tier. Awesome. Praise God. Praise God. All right, put your hands down. Across the room with nobody looking around. Let's all say this prayer together. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I want to know you. I want to give you room in my heart. I thank you for a new beginning. Thank you for your grace. I confess I can't do this on my own. I need you to so forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. And I believe you make me new you made me new, that I am new, in Jesus' name, amen. Can we put our hands together and celebrate with those 13 people who made a decision for Jesus? Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Pastor Chris. What a good reminder that we serve a God whose business it is to do the impossible. Amen. 
Well, for those of you that may have made a decision today to believe in Jesus and what he's done, would you meet us out at the Next Steps table? We'd love to give a gift to you, help you with the Next Steps. Those of you that are here for the first time as well, if you join us at the Next Steps table, we'd love it. Love to just uh, talk to you a little bit and help you and give you a gift. Finally, um, generosity. All that we have, I believe, comes from the Lord. So I thank you, Epic Family, for your generosity and your gifts and tithes. And a reminder that the Joy Box is on your way out, or you can give by text. Otherwise, have a great week. I love you. Epic loves you. Enjoy. Bye-bye. Peace.